when my relative went missing, the suspected that she was out partying, and that's what they reported in the media. Even the community members, they kind of took a step back from looking for her. They believed in that stereotype, and that stereotype is getting reinforced within um, social media, within the police system, within our communities, and we really need to stop reinforcing those images of our women. I had enough funds to travel around the country. The Law Foundation is a fund that lawyers uh, have to give a percentage of their fees to, and then it's used for educational purposes. So Aboriginal Legal Services got that, um, made the proposal to make this film, and we got enough funding for me to be able to shoot interviews from Newfoundland across the country all the way to Victoria, BC. Um, actually, I might share with people that we had Aboriginal Legal Services also applied to a commemoration grant and we received funds to share the film to go back to those communities and other communities who are interested in hosting us and travel myself along with someone else who's in the film. It's been Terry Montour and Alex Wilson who, who've gone with me so far and we still have a little bit of time so if you're in a community who would like us to visit. It's been very difficult because of COVID. We started this before COVID and then we had to take a long break with the pandemic and we're able to go back to Vancouver Island in the summer, um, Sault Ste. Marie in October and Montreal in November. I have a question, Audrey. This is Barb General or Clindius General. Have you shown this, I don't know, send this information to the police? Because I think one of the biggest barriers is the police and given recognition to the missing and murdered. Yeah. Yeah, the, the cool thing is, like I kind of had in mind when I was making it that it would be useful, you know, it's made for the community, but that it's also useful for people who come in contact with our community and sometimes don't do such a great job helping them. So it has been shared with police, um, at a, I think at, a, at least once at an Ontario training session. It's also been shared with judges, with new judges. I personally wasn't there and didn't do the Q&A, so I don't know how well it was received, but we have definitely, we have a police liaison in Toronto, an Aboriginal peacekeeping liaison who I've also uh, shared it with for her colleagues. It's amazing how much information you were able to compile into that film in a half an hour. You know, it's just so much information to help people from every aspect. So. Congratulations for doing that. And, uh, you know, it, it really showed a lot of input. And I think the ceremony was, you, you mentioned it at the beginning, the strawberry ceremony each February 14th, I think in downtown Toronto. And that's going to be happening again, coming up in February. Yeah, I would love to say a few words about that. We're very sad. We really hope that we would be back at police headquarters this year. You know, last year there was restrictions I think it was like 10 maximum gathering was 10 people. So we couldn't invite people to join us at police headquarters. Mm -hmm. And we chose to live stream our ceremony, which was then interesting. Um, some of the feedback we got, like, well, of course, you know, we miss just like now we miss being in person with people and being able to hug and hold each other close. On the other hand, like over 8,000 people saw the recording of the video. There were about 300 people live with us. And people remarked that it's quite an intense experience being at police headquarters, you know, like it's it's a place that it, where people have experienced harm. Um, and we go there to make a point, to, to show the complicity of the state and the systemic nature of the violence. And we have a commitment to those ancestors and those sisters in spirit to show up there every year. So even though we weren't there, you see the picture behind me, we went early in the morning and we decorated the fence that they actually, they put up a fence around police headquarters after all the demonstrations that happened in the wake of George Floyd's murder and Black Lives Matter. Also Regina, Regina Korczynski Paquette, a black indigenous woman who fell to her death, like Cheyenne, like um, Bella. Uh, in that case, there were eight police officers in the apartment with her, but we still went to police headquarters and we will be doing an art installation there again this year. But our ceremony that Wanda will hold will be at a different location. And people remarked that 
you know, they were actually able to better understand and hear her sharing the strawberry the story of the strawberry. Because when you're at police headquarters, the first year we were maybe 150 people, but now a thousand people come through there. It's incredible, like how much it's grown, especially sort of in the wake of Idle No More, we started to triple our numbers and we were around eight, 900 people. And now, depending on how cold it is, you know, that's how many people come through. So often you can own, we have a great sound system and you can hear Wanda and you can participate in the ceremony, but it's another thing to be kind of up close virtually. So I invite everyone, there is a, I'm going to put a link into the chat now. If you're on Facebook, you can follow No More Silence on Facebook, uh, go to that link and join the event page because we will use that to live stream on Monday, February 14th. We usually start around 1230 take we were there for about an hour uh, there will be some family mem family members present who will share about their loved ones and Wanda will share teachings and prayers we'll have our drummers and it would be great to have you join so uh, the video was amazing it was packed with so good information but basically what I wanted to say was more of a comment as somebody that has gone through don't want to call it the vicious cycle but a bit of vicious cycle of investigation and that kind of thing personally as a victim of sexual assault um, how you guys had mentioned how important it is to um, have a really good group of peer and support and that kind of thing how important that is just because it's true, it is very intimidating to be questioned and then the police you know asking the same question over and over with different words to see if your story is collaborating and it's, it's very intimidating, it's very re-traumatizing. So I just wanted to say that it was amazing to see how everybody has mentioned the support is so important and it is not only just for the victim but for everybody to actually being able to get through a trauma or even a loss of a loved one or a friend. So I just want to say that was really nice. And it's nice that it's being reinforced because ultimately that's what's going to keep you up. Yeah, I can only underscore what you're saying. And also, thank you so much for your courage because it's, you know, very, very small percentage of sexual assaults ever are reported because it is often so difficult. That's something I'll be talk we'll be talking about tomorrow at our Aboriginal Legal Services workshop because we do offer that kind of support to survivors. And like most recently, I did court support for a survivor. It was actually live court in Hamilton before Omicron hit and they had to shut everything back down to virtual. But in this case, you know, the survivor had family, had friends it was so important and would not have been possible for her to do without all of that all of her loved ones it's true her. especially when they tell you like you know well do you think you maybe did something that kind of attracted the attention or you know you do you think you may have um done anything to deserve it or you know it's not something you ever want to tell somebody you know so for sure the support 100 percent hands down will get anybody through the tough times Thank you so much, Daniela. And I see that uh, Anna Betty has her hand up as well. Go ahead, Anna Betty. Well, first of all, thank you very much, um, Audrey, for doing this. And to all who were part of this film, many of the people on um, that were speaking, um, I've been able to meet at some time or another um, within the circles. So thank you uh, to all of to all of you. At this time, uh, I, I think you, some of you have heard about um, the Broken Trust Report, uh, which is a report, an inquiry that found that Thunder Bay Police did not uh, fail to investigate some deaths here in, in Thunder Bay. You know, so that's kind of been part of the work that I've been a part of as well, is to address those systemic racisms that are that exist not only in the police services, but also in the court systems as well. And it's very frustrating at times because many times, it, you know, we don't get, um, it's so difficult to acquire, uh, I guess, capacity to support families that are seeking justice. So I'm grateful that you were able to uh, acquire funding to put this film together. It's a great film. 
within uh, some of the circles that I am involved in, I will certainly be sharing this. And I hope that you will also consider looking at like the lack of investigation resources for um, homicides that happen in remote communities. Presently, some of the homicides are investigated by usually uh, the OPP or the RCMP uh, in most of our First Nation or Inuit communities. So there's the process is a little bit different. And also the inadequacies in terms of support for the families, for the victim is pretty well many times there is none at all. So anyway, I think we also need to address that as well. We have been trying, and it's quite difficult at times to get that support to ensure that our families get that support. Thank you for sharing your film, Ingwich. Ingwich, for your comments. It's so true that remote and northern communities are often left out of discussions or, you know, don't have the resources on the ground. I would encourage you to watch, uh, if you go back to the video, the Innu women from Labrador, they are, you know, good cases in point for that example, good examples of that. And they share a little bit about how they cope. Hello, this is Sandy, Sandy Montour from Gunokosha. I just wanted to ask if there is any resources for media, if there's any um, guidelines or best practices or something that has been developed for media when Indigenous women go missing or are murdered. Um, is there, if there's anything, any kind of guidelines that they, they should be following or that has been developed like more of more like a best practice. We did try to address that, you know, to the extent that you can do it in five or 10 minutes. Terry Montour speaks to that question in the film, but we haven't got anything, you know, beyond that, that we've created as a resource. But she does give some pretty good, I think she gets to the heart of the matter. She's actually, and her expertise comes from being a representative a union rep at the Canadian Media Guild. You know, in the next several days with this gathering, these are the kind of comments that we will be trying to take note of because we hope that after our gathering is done next week, we will be able to pull together people's comments and what you see that needs to be done and whether there's an opportunity as part of an action plan that we can be taking collectively with all of the Ontario First Nations through uh, Chiefs of Ontario and with our First Nation Women's Council. So we're taking note of these suggestions. And so that's why it's really helpful to go ahead and, and make these comments. Again, there was so much information shared in the film. And in case uh, anybody joined us a bit late, I think the website, it, we should take note of that as well, Audrey. So that's Aboriginal Legal Services. And, put, and, and also yeah. I'll put my email address in there if you ever want to get in touch. I was thinking throughout the video, and especially when we were doing the ceremonies, are to help victims and victims' families kind of get through this experience in a way that, that uses culture and spirituality to help each other. It was just like, as women, I think we need to put resources into it once we have uh, situations where we are missing or have our sisters and moms and daughters um, go missing or become take or their lives taken by somebody. It would be cool if there was a way to push the ceremonies while all these women are still alive. And I know that the need for having resources and ways to handle it after they're gone, but if we in communities could be become stronger and more aware of the resources that we ourselves and our communities put into once people are gone, I think it's important for us to put those resources and do the ceremonies with our children, with our sisters, with our with our kids when um, when they're alive. I just got that, and I don't know if there's work being, I mean, I know there's work in communities being done on how to, uh, how for women and girls to uh, be safe and to have alternative 
options of what to do with their lives that's in in a healthy way but I just like I got the feeling that we put so much energy into the ceremonies after they're gone and we put so much of ourselves out there once they're gone it would be really awesome I guess to be able to put more of ourselves while they're around. I have so much appreciate that comment and agree with you I just put a little short link in the chat uh, about a film that's actually entitled Remember the Living, which speaks to that very question, uh, made by Monica Forrester, and it's on Sisters in Spirit and Indigenous sex workers. Another project that No More Silence, our current project, is actually very much focused on ceremony, and it's something that, you know, when people are talking to if officials, say, like at the City of Toronto, I remember they brought us together about three years ago to talk about the calls for justice out of the national inquiry. And one of the things that we asked them that we said that they could help us with that is in there is about access to ceremony. Mm -hmm. And so we have been pushing them to grant us a site for an accessible sweat lodge, because we don't have enough places in Toronto to hold ceremony. And we're working very hard with them. We have hopefully identified a, a site. And this particular lodge is going to be accessible because we want to be able to include all our relations who maybe are in a mobility device. So it's going to be a bit bigger than a lodge usually is, um, but also to accommodate other access needs. But yeah, I mean, the strawberry ceremony, I think, which modeled itself on the Memorial March in Vancouver, that's been around for 30 years, you know, and now we've been around for 17 and I think it's because we do ceremony that's why it's so powerful yes in that case it is to remember those who are gone but it definitely has a component of you know preventive com component that we just I can only say we need more of and there's another hand next hi good afternoon <clears throat> my name is Wanda Jameson I'm from Six Nations I'm a Mohawk Bear clan and my mother was murdered um 20 years ago I just wanted to comment for one on the video just um I just wanted to say that it was um very well put together and there was a lot of information it was really clear it was really you know short and sweet to the point and I really liked uh, the part that you added in there about employment insurance because although it sucks but reality is we got to eat and we have to pay bills and going through the court process that was six weeks long for my mother's uh killer I was a teacher a preschool teacher at the time and yeah I had to miss work <laughs> you know and I just had a baby so it was it was a rough time I can't remember how I got it together but anyways I feel like that kind of information is important and I think that um you know as a family who's going through something like that the last thing they should have to worry about is money so I feel like putting that information, that resource out there, like people don't really think of that, right? Like in the community, the, the helpers, the people who are reaching out and, you know, it's, it's, it's fine, but it, I, I like that. I thought that was really uh, very useful, very important. And I feel like as a family member, if someone were to sit down and say, listen, you know, you can go on EI, there's, you know, then it would have been a little bit of a weight off, you know what I mean? I mean, although everything ended up working out. And also along the lines as the last speaker talked about taking sort of a proactive approach in terms of the ceremony with the women who are here now as a former drug addict, um, alcoholic, I always felt like I couldn't attend certain things because I was using, not necessarily I was high, but because I was in that sort of style. So I feel like people who are living their life, women at risk should be welcome no matter what. And I know it's hard because some people have, you know, different beliefs than others, but I feel like you know, in order to save someone, I feel like if they know they could attend no matter what, then they'd be more apt to reach out. The ones who are conducting the ceremony should be using, but I'm saying, you know, like in the cities anyways, that's where I'm in. I'm in Hamilton. So I feel like, yeah, if there was something like that where they know they could come no matter what, it would, I don't know. I think it might make a difference in terms of ceremony. And also if um, they like women understood that doing this ceremony doesn't necessarily always having mean to attend this big shindig like I think that it would be important that they understood so whoever you know they're connected with there's all kinds of people right like I'm in the city like I said you know the health center the friendship center if they knew that they could do ceremonies like on their own you know like they could you know smudge on their own they could pray they could you know do their grandmother boon ceremony in their apartment on their like I think if they understood like it doesn't always have to be like out and this big thing you don't have to attend this big thing they could still sort of find that connection somehow like 
you know, if you don't want to attend something big. I really appreciate that comment. Um, I'm just bombarding you with links, but Wanda Whitebird, the elder who runs our strawberry ceremony, who leads the ceremony, she's very harm reduction focused and very welcoming and inclusive. She talks about that in the trailer of a new film that we just finished and the trailer is already up and it really is about ceremony in times of a pandemic harm reduction is a big part one thing one dream that we have that we hope to realize in the coming year is to hold ceremony at allen gardens if anybody's from toronto they know that's kind of like an inner city res uh, in terms of who lives at allen gardens and who's ho the houseless people who are at allen gardens and we want one thing that Wanda has been thinking about doing is a 24 hour fast. So like improvising a little bit on the, the structure and the rules, but uh, making an opportunity for people who really need ceremony the most to be able to join in ceremony with us. And I'm happy to uh, hope to see some of you again tomorrow when we talk about how Aboriginal Legal Services contributes to this work. I'm really excited about Beverly Jacobs' keynote. As I mentioned earlier, I've been working with Bev since to the early 2000s when she was at Amnesty. She's really a pillar, you know, in our community of this work. I'm excited to hear her thoughts on how we go forward. We just want to, again, thank you very much, Audrey, for sharing today, for giving us all a chance to view it again and, you know, to learn more from all the information that you've included in there and to let us know the additional work that you're doing now. It sounds like it's very timely and uh, really, really important. So can really relate to all of that. Thank you.